So to start, we're going to talk about text-based data and why it's so difficult to work with and um, where people fall short when they try to visualize it um, and to work with it. So generally, you run into this stuff very often if you do any survey-based survey research. Um, because in Qualtrics or in Google Forms or SurveyMonkey, it's really, really easy to include a free response question. And sometimes it's very revealing. It's, a, it's an important thing to do because you, you learn more about why people make the decisions they make. Um, so this, this screenshot here is from um, a study that I ran um, where we asked people, we said, you have a hypothetical 100 extra dollars. You can donate it to this NGO if you want. How much do you want to donate to this NGO and how much do you want to keep? So that's what these two columns show. They say they won't donate any. They will keep all 100% of the $100. Um, so you can see some of the splits here. And we use these numeric numbers in the paper to, to do statsy things on it. Um, but then we also, just for fun, included a text-based column just to ask them, why did you make that decision? And some of the responses are fantastic. Um, I am poor, so they're just going to keep it there. Or I feel like I need to deserve. I I feel like I deserve to treat myself, um, etc. But other people like talk about why they do it because of the organization. So we talk. Um, this organization that we're using here is the International Rescue Committee, which um, works with um, refugees. It's the IRC. Helps with refugee resettlement throughout the United States and around the world. Um, and so some people specifically say, I will donate 69% um, to help with their cause. Um, but some other people, so this person says they think it's a worthy cause, they'll give 90%. Other people say, I don't fully agree with their mission. And so they're specifically not um, going to donate to the organization because they don't like them. Um, they don't like helping refugees, apparently, or they don't like the NGO th itself. And so these these why responses are fantastic. Um, we pepper them in. We pepper them throughout the paper that we wrote for this um, to show like here's some of the reasoning why why people gave for donating or keeping. Um, but there's no systematic way to do anything with this data. We can't find the average reason why. Um, we can't find. We can't use that in a regression model. Every single one of those rows is different. And so we have to figure out other ways of parsing what's in there. Um, what we ended up doing with this, just because there were only 400 rows and um, it was fairly quick reading, um, we just read them closely and picked out the quotes that like were helpful and useful. Um, but if you had tens of thousands of responses, good luck doing that all by yourself and reading every single row. Um, and so one very common thing that people do is they will copy this column and stick it in a word cloud generator online. You can make these really easily. You just go to Google and search for a word cloud, and then you can paste a whole bunch of text in, and it will make something that looks like this. Um, but these are odd. Um, Ten-ish years ago, they were like all the rage, even in academic articles. Like people loved these things. Um, you could make them on Facebook and like share them with your friends and stuff, but you could also put them in like an actual journal article and people would be like, that's so cool, it shows trends. Um, it doesn't really show any trends. Um, what it really does is it just sizes the, the most popular words or the most common words um, by size. And so the, the more repeated the words are, the bigger they are. But that's the only dimension it's really showing. So if we're talking about the grammar of graphics, there's nothing on the x-axis, there's nothing on the y-axis. These aren't even colored or filled by anything. These are just random colors. Um, the only aesthetic we have in this plot here is size. Um, and so it's not incredibly helpful. It's showing us one dimension of the data. This is essentially a, the pie chart of the text analysis world. And they're not very helpful. Um, but people still love them for whatever reason. Um, there's only like one specific circumstance in general where these are okay, and it's kind of related to the pie chart um, rule of being okay. Um, with a pie chart, you don't want to include a pie chart if it has like 15 different categories or if you can't really tell any differences between them. Um, same thing with these text clouds or these word clouds. You don't want to use it if you can't really tell if there's like one overarching theme that comes out, um, and that's super prominent. And so in this case, dumb is the biggest one because I purposely made it that way. Um, but most word clouds will just have like five or six big words and they'll be slightly different from each other. And that's all you can really see. Um, in this instance, I had you read this tweet here. 
Um, this is a relatively okay use of word clouds. Um, that first word cloud that has what Americans have heard or read about Donald Trump is the standard kind of bad word cloud. You can't really tell what is going on in there. Um, you know that president is an important word. Immigration is speech and make. Um, it's really hard to read because some of the words are sideways and that's because it's supposed to be artsy, sure. Um, but that's kind of like a pie chart with 15 different categories in it. Um, but if you compare it to the other um, word cloud on the other side, email is massive and then all the other words are small. And so this is what Americans have heard or read about Hillary Clinton in fall 2016, uh, six weeks or so before the election. And so it's comparing um, those those trends and words um, in the topics that people have heard about these two presidential candidates. And so even though it's a text cloud and that's they're bad, you can't really read anything there, it does make its point because email is so massive. And that's the main story they're trying to tell here is that in the six weeks before the election and leading up to the election, the only thing people heard about and remembered about Hillary Clinton was her email scandal. Um, Donald Trump had a whole bunch of other topics and sure there's stuff in there, wall is in there, Muslim is in there, wife is in there, sure. Um, all of these other things are kind of dwarfed by the email thing. And so in this one in this one instance where you have kind of a standard bad word cloud and then a word cloud with one massive word and everything else small, that sets up the, a good contrast there and makes this okay. Um, if it was just one word cloud by itself, not okay. If it was just the Hillary Clinton one by itself, semi-okay, um, because it still has the massive text here, but then that's not comparing it to um, Donald Trump here. But with, the, with them both like this, that's arguably kind of a good case of the use of word clouds. Um, seeing good word clouds in the wild is rare. Um, this is like the only example I've ever come across. So you generally don't want to use word clouds um, because again, you're mapping one dimension of your data onto a plot. Um, when you could map a whole bunch of different dimensions, you could color the words by something, you could position them by something, you, you don't just have to size them. So it's, it's kind of a weak plot. Um, so the fancier way of doing this, or what I call word clouds for grownups, is to use the principles that are in this text mining book here that I had you glance through. Um, at a technical level, you're doing the same thing that you do with word clouds. Um, all of the methods that, that are covered in this book by Julia Silge and David Robinson are just counting words. That's all you're doing. Um, but then you do fancier things with those word counts instead of just shaping or sizing text by how many words there are. Um, and so I had you look at some different examples of like fancier counted words. So there was this example here, the, the she snuggles and he gallops example, um, where Julia Silge um, got access to thousands of scripts from Hollywood and just looked at the stage directions where it said like this actress or this character does something. So it's not the actual words that they say, it's the screen directions that they get. And then she was able to put it into, or she used tidy text, which is the package that we're going to be working with today, to split all of those screen directions into pairs of words. And she found all of the ones that said he verbs and she verbs. And so she could count all those up. And then she calculated the ratio of how many he verbs and she verbs um, there were for the same verb. And so with snuggles, Occasionally, one of the stage directions would say he snuggles or John snuggles or Peter snuggles or whatever. Um, but most of the time, based on the ratio of these, these two verbs here, based on the two genders that were in the data set, um, women were like eight times more likely to snuggle than men and um, were five times more likely to giggle and squeal and sob and weep. Um, while men are way more likely to strap, um, so they're strapping their swords on or something, to gallop, to shoot, to howl, to kill, to vault. Um, so these are like more aggressive, manlier words of destruction and, and stuff like this. And this is like bubbly, giggling, and emotional sobbing and weeping and stuff. And so you can see these trends in these scripts just by counting words. All they did here was count words. They counted pairs of words that were he, verb, and she, verb. 
this could have been a weird word cloud, um, but rather than doing a word cloud, they did some fancier stats things to the counts and ended up with a much deeper story with like really cool findings in it. Um, another example was um, this plot or this chart here. This is um, also by Julia Silgi. Um, this is a map using um, GeoFacet, which you've been using in other exercises, um, showing um, which states are mentioned in song lyrics. And so she got access to the Genius.com API, um, which has all of the lyrics for every song ever. And she went through that and identified every song that mentions a United States state and then counted all of the states that got mentioned and how many times they got mentioned. And then instead of making a word cloud where California is big and Georgia is big and Tennessee is big and New York is big and Texas, those seem to be the most popular states to sing about. Um, instead of just showing it in a word cloud, she actually mapped it onto this geofacet thing and um, filled each of the state boxes by how many times um, they were mentioned. Since you can see the relative um, frequency of getting mentioned. There are lots of states that rarely get mentioned. There are like no songs about Rhode Island or Connecticut or Alaska or Oregon. Um, and so like, or North Carolina and South Carolina, nobody sings about those, um, but everybody sings about like Georgia and Tennessee and Texas. And so this is again, a much deeper story than just showing a word cloud of state names. You don't wanna do that because you're losing a lot of the dimensionality of the data. You're just showing one thing. You're mapping the count onto size and that's the only thing you get. In this plot here, you get an X axis, you get a Y axis for latitude and longitude. Um, you get fill, um, which is filled by color. And so we have three, or filled by the count um, or the proportion. And so what we end up with is three different aesthetics in one map or one figure instead of a single one, which communicates a lot more information. So moral of the story is you generally don't ever want to show word counts um, when, or word clouds whenever you can. You're still going to calculate word counts, which are the foundation for those word clouds, but you can do it in better ways. Um, even if you just want to show one dimension, um, you can, instead of doing a word cloud, you can do a bar chart and have the bar chart just show the frequencies of, of specific words, how many times the words are said. And that's similar to the pie chart idea. Rather than doing a pie chart with like six different slices or 10 different slices, you just do a bar chart with those six different categories or those 10 different categories. And then you can see the differences in counts between all of the different categories. Um, with word clouds, you can't tell, um, just looking at it, if there's a difference, like if one word was used five times and another word was used seven times, that's impossible to see um, when it's sized differently and the text is shaped differently and the font is, is quirky and rotated sideways or upside down. You can't communicate that information the same way as like a bar chart. Um, so avoid word clouds where possible is the moral of the story.